project was years of my research team with the Forest Service and University of Washington characterizing fuels with really traditional measures. And um, we knew that with advancing um, technology, in particular with um, next generation physics-based models of fire behavior and smoke, that we needed to move into a different way to characterize fuels. So the project was um, inspired by that, um, funded very fortunately by the Department of Defense Strategic and Environmental Research and Development Program. And we also have Joint Fire Sciences Program funding um, for some of this work as well. I just advance the slide here, if it will, there we go. So very large project team. I wanted to introduce some of um, our players. Roger Otmar is um, a close um, lead with me on the Forest Service side. And other scientists are um, Eric Roll from Tall Timbers Research Station is doing a lot of the terrestrial LIDAR um, work with us. Nick Skronsky is um, also working on terrestrial LIDAR as well as um, advising a graduate student, uh, Michelle Bester on quantitative structural modeling. Jim Cronin is part right there with me in having done a lot of traditional um, field measurement and is moving in. Um, he's the field supervisor for this project and has done a lot on the study design. Russ Parsons contributed slides for this presentation and has been a specialist in 3D fuel modeling with Stanfire, as some of you have heard of, and we're in close collaboration on a new venture with Russ. Um, Andy Hudak works um, a lot on um, fuel consumption research, amongst other things, and landscape mapping. Um, so he's working with us on what we're calling object-based fuel characterization. Um, Maureen Kennedy and, and I have worked a long time together. She um, is helping out with quantitative analysis and structural modeling. Ben Bright is our data manager. Louise Loudermilk is cl close collaborator on um, 3D fuel characterization. And then we um, have graduate students that I'm very happy to say are very much integrated with our team and um, co-creating this as we go along. So another inspiration for this project for me is um, we are seeing these fantastic images on um, the web right now on being able to characterize canopy fields in 3Ds. I actually just um, saw these on Twitter the other day and I just thought they were so beautiful. They could even make like postcards. Um, Andrew posted these on his Twitter feed. And one of the things that I think of when I see these canopy field characterizations is that they're great. They're great for biomass. We can understand a lot more about forests by doing high resolution mapping of forests. Um, but based on my research, um, a lot of my decision support that I do for my research has to do with fuel reduction treatments and prescribed burning. And we, um, those of us that have been on the ground with prescribed burns know that the tree stems and often not even the canopy are generally burning in these um, fires, it's the surface fuels. And indeed, even with wildfire events, um, the majority of fuels that are burning in those wildfires, unless it's a running crown fire are actually surface fuels. And so being able to do a great job with three dimensional surface characterization, that's the challenge for this project. So in order to do this, um, we have a hierarchical sampling design. So we're definitely making use of over on the left, um, core scale airborne LIDAR um, imagery so that we can map canopy fuels and also in open forests, um, maybe take a spy on some of the heterogeneity of the surface fuels. So that's one definite um, synoptic view of a forest that we wanna take. Um, in the meso scale, kind of the bridge in our analysis, we're using high resolution terrestrial LIDAR um, that actually can do quite a great job with um, some of the canopy fuels as well as the surface fuels, and then UAS-based photogrammetry. So we can get into some of that in a little bit. So that's our middle scale. And then at the finest scale, we're also using close range um, terrestrial LIDAR scanning and photogrammetry. So highly resolved, very close up image analysis that in the end does a much better job than we ever could at sampling these fields because it's just so highly resolved. So the objectives of our project really just boiled down are that we need to figure out a way to capture fuels with this imagery and know a couple of things. One, um, 
where the fields are in three-dimensional space and, um, and scale them for the models that we have. So one of the models that we're working with is FireTech and often puts the fields in a two by two by two liter um, cube. So that would be a scale that we'd be informing. Um, other models such as the WFDS model that's um, uh, closely developed by Ruddy Mel and my team um, can work at even finer spatial scales. And so our objective is to characterize fuels in three dimensions to develop these building blocks. And the challenge is to not only know where they are in three dimensional space, but also what they are. What type of fuel is this? Can we infer if this is a shrub, fine wood, litter, grass? And based on the typing that we do of this imagery, can we then apply a bulk density so we know the biomass per unit volume of that fuel and also other fuel properties, which I can get into later. So um, Russ Parsons has an excellent preamble to um, his fast fuels project. And boy, I mean, I think it's an aptly moved um, named project because they are moving very quickly on this project. But um, he sums up that there's a kind of fuels to model problem. So um, many of us field ecologists love to sample fuels and we can collect pretty good ones, especially now. Um, but a challenge has been and remains that um, we have a bunch of fuels information, but to date our traditional fire behavior models that use fire behavior fuel models often distill those fuels data into very limited inputs. So all this range of variability that we know is out there and we know is really important for fire behavior and smoke gets distilled into very low detail for fire models. Well, that actually is kind of changing rapidly right now because we have better models on the horizon. Um, so fast fuels has been a pretty excellent um, way to start thinking about ways that we can ramp in better information. So I don't want to steal too much of Russ's thunder because I think he would um, give an excellent webinar on this topic, but he and Lucas Wells and others have been working with FIA-based tree list data so that they could actually simulate um, trees in three-dimensional space based on FIA plots that have then been imputed to larger landscapes thanks to Karen Riley's work. Um, so in this, in this kind of complicated diagram, we can think about having a better fuel layer based on FIA tree data. Um, but then we're kind of still like, if we're just using simulated fuel beds, we might be just inferring a fuel model again for the surface fuels to assign a, a surface fuel um, for a fuel cell in the understory of that simulated space. So what Russ and others um, vision for this tool is, is that it's a good start, a place to start. And so the good work that we're doing and along with other people can bring in um, canopy fuel layers that are taken from airborne LIDAR or terrestrial LIDAR. So those can be replaced in the simulated space. And what we're working on in the 3D fuels part is they have this thing called a um, a layer set, so these polygons of understory fuels. And we think that our 3D fuels project can do a really good job with characterizing patches of say, grass dominated fuels or litter dominated fuels or fine wood dominated fuels or complexes of those and move them into a better mapping for prescribed burn planning or um, wildfire planning. So their strategy is to uh, go from okay fuels, which we've been kind of dealing with, to better fuels. Well, I guess they're okay fuels in this slide, sorry, um, are more the simulated fuels from FIA plots. Better fuels bring in um, LIDAR photogrammetry as well as the understory work that we're doing. And then we have finally some really good models to work with that actually rely on three-dimensional characterization of these fuels. All right, here's just an image of one of the fast fuels prototypes um, and just showing what they're being able to do with simulated fuels. And I, I will stop there because many of you might be getting motion sick. Okay, so moving on to our study design, I mentioned that we have a hierarchical sampling scheme. And so I'll just kind of step through that quickly. So on the left, um, we have a example of a forest and grassland site in Saikan, 
um, marsh preserve down in South Central Oregon. And I'm gonna actually be using that as just kind of our main site to explain this study. And so our site is actually relatively small, um, 200 by 200 meters. And for that um, synoptic scale, the kind of bird's eye scale of this unit, we have airborne LIDAR that was already taken before our study. That was a site requirement for us. Um, terrestrial LIDAR is taken in grids um, that are shown in the middle panel here. So there's 25 points spaced at, um, I believe it's um, 15 meters where um, terrestrial LIDAR, three, 360 degree terrestrial LIDAR scanning is done. So those are stitched together for a synoptic terrestrial LIDAR scan. We also have um, drone based um, structure from motion um, video that is then made into photogrammetry. Um, so true color, um, three dimensional representations, um, both at a synoptic and then a finer scale. So at our finer scale, each one of these points here in the middle shows one of our um, potential plots. We actually put in nine plots where we do destructive sampling and an additional four to six plots where we just scan them only. And so at those plots, we're also taking even a higher resolution terrestrial LIDAR and a closer range structure from motion photogrammetry. And then finally, within each one of the five meter plots that we have chosen uh, randomly for destructive sampling, we have a very systematic way of locating five clip plots. And uh, we'll get into much more clip plot later, the detail later. The goal for this basically is to start building relationships between the imagery, both the photogrammetry and the terrestrial LIDAR, um, and what we're destructively sampling in these clip plots. Not only the bulk density of the material that we carefully measure, but also the type of the material. We build models that basically use the imagery instead of our field data to predict um, biomass per volume. And then we can use our hierarchical sampling strategy to scale up and test the models at um, coarser spatial scales. And so uh, we've been actually really challenged by COVID as with everyone, but we've been kind of marching along and making some steady progress within this project. We're in our third year. Um, our goal was actually inspired by the fact that my research team, the Fire Environmental Research Applications team, um, that's half Forest Service and half University of Washington folks, have done quite a bit of work on photo series. Maybe some of you have seen our digital photo series where we actually range um, fuels that are common to prescribe burning um, at low biomass up to sites with higher biomass. We had budget to do a total of 16 sites. And so we actually don't have a huge library of these 3D fuels, but um, inspired by that approach for the Southern Southeastern sites that we're sampling that are really important for Department of Defense um, military installations. They do a lot of prescribed burning in the Southeast. We're sampling flatwoods that range from a one year rough, like immediately after a fire, up to a four to five year rough understory. And then um, it's kind of interesting, like Southern pine forests, Western pine forests, they can actually structurally look very similar in the overstory. And so we targeted open Western pine, well, ponderosa pine dominated stands. Um, again, you can kind of see that structurally they're not that dissimilar, but their understory fuel complexes are very different. So the black and white photos show where we still need to do sampling and then the color photos are where we're already done. Um, we're also, let's see, um, in the Southeast, we've not done as much just because of COVID, it's been hard to get there. So we're working on a flatwoods sites and then we're also moving on to a lob lolly sweet gum forest type that's more of a plantation forest for the Southeast. We've done quite a bit more because we can drive to these sites in the West. And so we actually have four Western grasslands, um, again, ranging from lower biomass up to higher biomass, and then Western Ponderosa Pine Forest or Ponderosa Pine Forest. All right, have a couple additional sites that are um, more heavy on the grass in the Southeast as well. All right, so I wanted to take you on a virtual field tour I think all of us are ready for an actual field tour um, to Cycad Marsh, Oregon. So this um, is in South Central Oregon, um, 
outside of um, Fremont National Forest on Nature Conservancy property. Um, Russ Parsons has done quite a bit of collaboration with the Nature Conservancy and adjacent Forest Service lands to do prescribed burn experiments there. So we joined on that. And you can see that this is a relatively young, open ponderosa pine site with bitter brush understory. So um, this will look familiar to you. It's the overview kind of nape imagery just with our plots here. And again, um, we collected terrestrial LIDAR at each one of these points. And then we had UAS-based photogrammetry fly over all the plots. And then um, for our five by five meter plots, um, the yellow ones are where we actually, I think, did sampling. Um, either we scanned only or we destructively sampled. I'm a little flustered here, so I can't remember. Oh, let's see, so the red are sampled with destructive sampling. And so now we're zoomed in into the understory, and this is just one of our five by five meter plots with these strange little squares here. Um, it's important to mention the squares. These are picked up in all of our imagery, and that's so important because that's how we tie the location of our destructive sampling to um, the terrestrial LIDAR and um, UAS-based photogrammetry point clouds that we have. So um, now I'll just kind of take you on the tedious destructive sampling that we're doing. This is Jim Cronin and Deborah Neemans. Um, we have a, a frame that we call a voxel frame. So um, a volumetric pixel. Um, and so this frame sits right on top of one of those squares and it actually has a sliding frame. So if we actually had a shrub that was up to a meter tall, we could start sampling at a meter tall what we basically do is start slicing through the fuels with a known volume, starting at a meter and then going down 10 centimeters. If there are no fuels there, then we get to start lower down, which always makes us kind of happy because this is very tedious work. I'll just show you a few of the slides. So for each of these 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter by 10 centimeter slices, so that's a known volume within the frame, we collect all the biomass and we also have a grid of 25 cubes. So each cube is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter. That's a voxel. Um, that cube um, gets inventoried. So we know what type of fuel is in each cube. And especially, this is kind of important, which ones are empty? So gaps in fuels also really matter for fire behavior. So we see here, Deborah actually clipping out all the shrub for that stratum. And so we could get a, um, biomass for the shrub and actually then know the bulk density, um, the biomass per unit volume of that layer. When we get down to the lower surface fuels, um, a lot of the action is in the lowest stratum, the zero to 10 centimeter stratum. Here I'm showing one that just has a lot of fine wood in them. And we actually go to the trouble at this point of um, destructively sampling five random voxels. So we actually get um, the type of fuels within that voxel as well as so we can like sort them out, which is very painful to do. Um, but then we know the known biomass um, per unit volume and also what it is for really what ends up being the most biomass on the site. It's kind of funny to think about, but the zero to 10 centimeter stratum packs a punch. It's got the dense, sometimes duff, litter, fine wood, and even low shrubs. So. And this is what it looks like after we're done with those five random um, sampled voxels. Um, so we've done our work to isolate them and um, get those cubes of fuels. And then finally, um, job well done. The destructive sampling is done for that um, voxel frame. So we're not done at that point. Um, the field crew has been spending a lot of time taking these bags of fuels back to the laboratory, sorting them for the lowest stratum and then drying and weighing them so that we get a dry weight biomass for a known volume. Okay, um, thanks for hanging in there with me. It's kind of um, important to tell you what's going into the details of the data that we're now presenting. So um, field-based occupied volume is one thing that we can do just based on our surveys. So what we're doing here is starting at, at the top of a voxel plot at the 90 to 100 centimeter stratum we have 25 cubes where we're just doing an inventory. Is there anything in this cube or not? In the case of this sample plot, 
we don't see any occupied cells and we, until we get down to the 40 to 50 meter stratum. And then we're starting to see some shrubs. And so this is simply just um, our checking off of all of these voxels, the 250 um, voxels within each one of our sampling plots, which are, which are occupied and what kind of fuel is there. And so um, the legend shows shrubs, herbs, oops, so we've got a slide um, transition there, fine wood, coarse wood, and litter. Okay. Um, Gina Kova is working with us on her master's degree on the voxel um, data sets along with close range photogrammetry. And she's building these really cool visualizations of that occupied volume. So on the right here, we have a site from the Southeast that has palmetto and gallberry in it. And based on our check marks of which of these cells was occupied by what kind of fuels, she's able to show this 3D visualization of which boxes have fuels versus not. And it's kind of a cool Tetris exercise to show the gappiness in these shrub fuel beds. But aerially, they look full, but they're not. Um, here's another one just showing that when we have coarse wood, um, it also kind of shows up in this kind of cluster here and can be represented in three-dimensional space. Okay, close range photogrammetry has been a really novel and kind of cool idea. We um, pretty incorrectly started calling it poor man's photogrammetry because it's inexpensive. We take GoPro video coverage and then use Agisoft software to convert it into structure for motion photogrammetry. So I think I was supposed to be able to show a little video of this. So this is actually a three dimensional um, in rendering now of these fuels and can be analyzed as such. It's a point cloud of um, fuels in X, Y, and Z coordinates. All right, so Gina is working pretty hard on um, comparing the close range photogrammetry, which is a pretty new technique with our field data. Now, um, Eric Roll worked on his dissertation um, to do a lot of work with calibrating terrestrial LIDAR imagery with field data and developed very promising um, indices. So one of them is a porosity index. And it's basically how dense are the returns for each kind of voxel in three-dimensional space in the imagery? And how does that porosity index, that in index of how dense the point cloud returns are, how does that uh, relate to measured um, bulk density for those voxels? And for at least that zero to 10 centimeter stratum that kind of packs the big punch for surface fuels, um, he found incredibly tight relationships. So his um, predicted biomass versus observed biomass is really promising. Um, another metric that we're exploring is um, plant area density ratio. So this would be the density of the point cloud returns on the hor horizontal axis compared to the vertical density. And this allows us, you can see the blue um, has tree stems pop, and these are actually our little plot um, bars right here. So it, it helps provide that vertical differentiation for shrubs that could be really important for our modeling as well. So right now we're in the stage of just evaluating which metrics work, work where. Um, some of them work really well for grass, and um, litter, but not, might not work as well for shrubs. So we're right now testing those to see if um, ideally there would be some metrics that could be applied anywhere that we wanted to sample, um, say in North America. But we suspect that there might actually be metrics that work better in some locations than others. So that's kind of where we're at right now. But the goal is to use our um, plot, each one of our voxel plots as um, a sample point. Um, we have 40 or five of them per site. And um, as we then build these models based on um, the voxel plots, then we can move up to coarser scale imagery. So again, hearkening back to our design where we have five by five meter plots, we can take the terrestrial LIDAR based um, metrics and see how well our models work at that scale and then move up based on the plots, the, the destructive plots that are in each five by five. And then we can start testing at the broader spatial scale that would be more pertinent to prescribed burning, such as 200 meter by 200 meter. One of the things we know is, is that um, point cloud data sets, whether they're from terrestrial LIDAR or photogrammetry, 
um, have some challenges when they try to penetrate dense vegetation such as shrubs. So you can imagine that perhaps we get some really great LIDAR returns from the outside and maybe even the middle of a shrub, but um, it's possible that the dense stem that has a lot of the biomass and can burn in a fire might be obscured. And so we're actually working with um, Michelle Bester, who's a PhD at West Virginia University on um, a project in which she's building quantitative structural models of common shrubs. So ideally what we can do is use our point cloud imagery to detect, ah, oh, yeah, that's a shrub, and then replace that shrub with a known um, archetypal shape of the shrub so that we know actually the biomass of the stem and the fine branches and can do a much better job at estimating the biomass of a site that way. So our object-based field classification is definitely not just shrubs. We're also classifying live versus dead fuels because we do have true color imagery to allow us to do that. LIDAR doesn't allow us to do that. It's just um, black and white, of course. And then fuel typing that we're trying to get to is major fuel types like shrub, grass, coarse wood, and litter. Um, litter could also include some fine wood. Okay, here's one more just um, view on quantitative structural modeling. So there's a couple different approaches that um, frankly, I'm still just learning about. Um, quantitative structural modeling is happening on the right. And then Eric Rowland and many others have been looking at actually simulated fuel beds. So hearkening back to fast fuels in which um, Russ Parsons and Lucas Wells are simulating trees based on treeless data. We might also be able to get to the point where we can um, simulate litter fuel beds based on probability distributions of known litter. Um, so it's kind of a fun um, thought to think that we can actually have images of broadleaf litter, of long needle pine litter, and start using computers to um, simulate um, a fuel bed out there. Okay, um, coming full circle now to um, one of the main purposes. Um, we're right now in the middle of a lot of analysis, but we're keeping our um, eye on the prize, which is, is that eventually we want to get to the point where we don't just have this library of fuels from these carefully characterized sites, but that we have a collection of um, calibrated data sets where we have the point cloud imagery and we have the reference data, and then we're able to build some scripts um, where we can actually interpret that imagery into fuel types and known um, biomass and be able to really kind of then start assigning three-dimensional fuels. And so that's the next phase of our project that I'm quite excited about because um, right now we're just parsing out the imagery we ha have and developing these models, evaluating the models. But then we could start moving into simulating 3D fuels at different spatial scales. And um, the models that we're um, evaluating are really exciting models. So um, at the really kind of like um, slow end of the fire modeling diagram, um, we have computational fluid dynamics models that um, really resolve combustion physics of fire behavior. And within these models, um, they're, they're high intensity models with um, a high need for a lot of data. Um, WFDS in particular can even be run at a one centimeter cube resolution. We're never gonna get there with our fuel characterization, but it begs the question like how highly resolved do we need to be with our fuel characterization? I've had good conversations with Ruddy Mel on that topic and um, one thing that's clear is, is that it depends really on the type of fire. If you have a really large wildfire with massive flame lengths, then the heterogeneity of fuels might not matter. There's so much energy that it might just leap through all of that spatial heterogeneity and keep burning. However, if you have a prescribed burn or a late season wildfire that's on marginal conditions, then all that heterogeneity of the fuels might really matter in terms of whether that fire will spread and how intensely it will spread. So um, we would like to do, I know that this is getting a little long on this one slide, but we're moving into a stage where we can work with Russ Parsons and others 
on um, testing out different resolutions of our fuels data and asking the question, does it matter? Can we um, afford to abstract a little bit more and we'll still get reasonable predictions under what kind of fire weather and under what kind of fuels? So one of the um, nitty gritty parts of the project that I'm saving for one of the later slides is funded by JFSP and has to do with um, compiling fuel properties. So I've mentioned quite a bit of work that we're putting into the second one on the list, which is bulk density. So um, we're measuring bulk density um, very carefully out in the field and we'll be able to contribute quite a bit of data for bulk density. But um, fire behavior fuel models rather um, rely on a number of other um, properties. And so we're collecting these data as well. Um, the, the ones that I'm just going to mention here are um, the um, packing ratio, particle density. Um, I think I actually, I needed to update this. We have some different um, heat content um, variables here. Um, surface area to volume ratio. So we're looking into the literature um, to pull out some of these values. We're not gonna be able to um, sample all the fields and take these measurements for everything. So um, stay tuned because we're gonna have quite a great database on known literature and develop a nice web tool to kind of disseminate these data. So um, another application beyond fire behavior field model that modeling that's really exciting to me is, is that um, I kind of mentioned that terrestrial LIDAR structure for motion photogrammetry um, give us point clouds that are in X, Y, Z dimensions. So um, where they can actually penetrate fuels, they do a really beautiful job in mapping where fuels are and where they are not. Um, they're actually much better than what we can do with traditional fuel map, um, mapping. And so I've been, and I've been a participant in a lot of fuel consumption studies and written papers on them. And we generally are using a variety of methods to get at what is pre-burn fuel loading and what is post-burn loading. So we might do clip plots in shrubs and grassland fuels, and then we might run line intercept transects to estimate the wood. Each one of those sampling techniques has some um, error associated with it. So it's pretty exciting to envision a new rate world of using say terrestrial LIDAR scanning to get a three-dimensional image of the fuels pre-burn and post-burn um, with the careful calibration that we're doing to known biomass or known bulk density, then we'll have a much better sense of what actually consumed in these fires not just important for smoke, but also really important for getting a better estimation of um, our emissions. So, um, so yeah, fuel consumption leading to smoke and emissions. Okay. All right. Um, I figured that I'd just give you kind of a rapid fire tour of our project to date. Um, I'd love to come back, you know, in a couple of years and share where we're at at that point. Um, the project website that we've developed um, is up to date right now. We have a pretty detailed study plan um, that we're proud of and um, are also archiving our presentations and study details. So if you'd like to learn more, um, I'd invite you to check out our website. Um, with that, um, I can open it up to some questions. Oh, here's one more team publications. So um, I'm just gonna leave this up for a little bit um, in case people wanna write down some of these, but they're also available on our website. Thanks, Susan. So yeah. there, is, there is a question and I'll go ahead and, and relay it. Great. Um, because I know, smoke, Rick. Okay. <laughs> because smoke from burning stumps overnight significantly contributes to smoke into communities from prescribed burning, I'm wondering if any of this work is looking at characterizing stump mass into the fuel characterization. Yes. So um, I agree with you, Rick, that coarse wood is really important and I glossed over it. So I'm going to go back because I think it's important to mention this. So plant area density ratio is a good one here. Um, the TLS-based metrics might work really well for fine fuels, um, but then they might also help us out with um, identifying objects that we can um, map 
and then assign known bulk density to. So in this picture right here on the left, you can see um, that we have live stems and then some sort of mystery might be a stump, which is why I'm showing it here. Um, that, that's just easily detected. We're seeing that with logs on our site too, that once again, these point clouds um, are pretty faithful to what's out there. And so if we can characterize um, the wood density for the stumps and logs, um, we're, we're a long way there. All right, any other questions? Go ahead and um, you can either put them in the Q&A or if you wanna put them in the chat. Perfect. We can give a little time. Sometimes it uh -huh. takes a while to- No worries. Type things in. Okay, another question from Rick. Mm -hmm. How frequently will the 3D fuel layers be updated in the future? They won't, not like that. So um, the sites that we're sampling, um, we're actually trying to pair wherever we can with prescribed fire opportunities. And so um, if the fuels are still relatively the same when a prescribed burn could happen, then very conceivably someone could um, do post burn image um, image acquisition and you know model or um, measure fuel consumption that way. Forgot to mention that another part of fuel fuel consumption that's important is is that um, we can also start thinking about the fire effects. So if there's um, fuel consumption of coarse wood, um, that can be a really um, important indicator of. Um, fire effects for trees, et cetera, if the coarse wood is next to a tree. So it gives us a spatial mapping of fuel consumption that's pretty new. Um, so back to Rick's question, um, these data sets will live on and hopefully be really useful as building blocks for similar sites, um, but we're not planning to um, resample these unless there's a prescribed fire opportunity. Okay, so the questions are coming in. I'll take them in order, at least mm -hmm. in the Q and A. You, you can bet. probably see them. How yep. large rocks are being resolved under this? Yeah, Not so wood. Um, you know, it's kind of funny because I know how we're going to do this, but we haven't done it yet. So I don't want to falsely um, present where we're at. But um, the objects, such as large rocks. Um, I think they're gonna stand out really well, although we haven't had them yet in our sites. So um, once again, um, because we've got a variety of ways of looking at both the terrestrial LIDAR and photogrammetry, it, objects pop. And so we could either um, do our own interpretation or we might even get super sophisticated. We're super happy to share these data sets um, if there could be some machine learning um, that could go along with it too. Good. So here's someone that um, <clears throat> wonders, does the data vary on the same site in the spring versus the fall? Oh, that's such a great question. No, and we've actually got a really big problem with that right now. Um, so because of COVID, um, I'm just going to, sorry, I'm just, I thought it would come up sooner. Uh, we've been having to really do much more in Washington because our Seattle-based crew can drive to sites and um, uh, still remain pretty socially distanced and safe. And so I live in the Metau Valley. And so we actually have a site here in um, the Metau. Um, we tried to sample it in October and um, it turns out that snow came really early to us. Um, I love snow, so I was a little conflicted because early winter is great. But unfortunately, what it means for us is, is that um, I'm carefully checking the sites right now to see if we can get back out there. Because in the springtime, as soon as there's snow off, herbaceous vegetation just erupts from the ground. And so our fall sampling 
would not apply at all to the spring. So we're working through that right now. There's a chance since um, the only thing left um, to sample are in the zero to 10 stratum. So even if the snow compacted it, we can still sample the biomass and it will be okay. But if we wait even a couple weeks, that's a very different field bed. Yeah, great question. Yeah, um, good work. Outstanding work from a great team. Um, would you consider using a drone-based LIDAR? That, that using a drone-based LIDAR might improve the results or at least the workflow? We have talked about that and it's um, definitely possible. And so um, right now, uh, I don't wanna put words in Adam Watts's mouth, um, but it sounds very much like we might be able to start partnering with um, Desert Research Institute um, that have a lot of fun toys to check out. And one of them, you know, could certainly be that um, you have LIDAR hitched to a drone. So um, there, there are things developing. Um, we're gonna have some challenges because we wanna have consistent data sets, but we also want to incorporate um, new technology. And um, yeah, there's a lot of new stuff coming online. Okay, so there's the project website. Someone had asked to see it. So if you wanna just leave that up there for a little bit. Um, <clears throat> so there's some curiosity about whether you use turnkey TLS post-processing software or created your own analysis. And right. I'm interested to hear what hardware you used and why. Um, you know, so we actually bought a Regal, um, it reminds me a little bit of Harry Potter. I, I'm not technologically very um, interested. And so the actual um, model of Regal is something I don't remember, but we have a really nice um, uh, terrestrial LIDAR scanning um, equipment for this project. And someone probably will chat what we actually have. Um, so, and then in terms of post-processing, we are actually using Agisoft um, and, um, from there, we will develop our own scripts for identifying field types um, based on the TLS metrics. Super happy to share um, our work plan, which is on our website um, that explains some of that. And we'll keep updating. Um, we want it to be a living document. And another question, are there opportunities to offer a prescribed fire to be modeled or um, prescription to be modeled? Um, yes, so it really depends on um, where. Um, those opportunities for the Western sites are kind of closing just because um, we are trying to be pretty efficient with our time and um, finish them up. We're in um, communications right now with Los Alamos National Laboratory, which is a Department of Energy site to do our final ponderosa pine and final grassland site there. Um, However, I would be really interested in kind of hearing about um, opportunities and there's a potential always to do kind of a new funded work to kind of build on this. You know, one of the field types that we keep being hearing about um, are more like pinion juniper and trying to build a series. So we're open to the possibility of expanding field types and doing more work in the future for sure. And about how much crew time does each clip voxel plot require? Once we're trained up, we're um, more efficient. Um, field crew is probably a lot more efficient than me, although I've been out there a lot doing this. Um, for 45 clip plots, um, the actual sampling would take um, five to seven days. So it's, um, it depends on the clip plot, which is why I didn't really go to that level. We sigh when we see a clip plot that actually has shrub fuels all the way up to, you know, that 100 centimeter mark um, and that we have to do the entire meter of fuels. So it really depends on the clip plot. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Any other questions for Susan? Okay, well, seeing none and having it be 45 minutes, I think, Susan, thank you very much for, oh, yeah. for this presentation. And um, yeah, when you want to come back and talk about how well it's going, and please do. We'd love to have okay, you Okay, well, thank you so much. It was fun to share. Okay. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone. And I hope you all stay safe.
and have a nice weekend. It's coming up. It is. Okay, take care all.